every agenda has the dates of everything we've done for this. <laughs> Helpful. Yes. Good evening and welcome to the Monday, May 6th uh, special meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, could you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Please have the roll. Chairman Garvin. Here. Councilor Devereaux. Here. Councilor Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councilor Randall. Here. And Councilor Straw. Here. Thank you very much. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak to something that is not on tonight's agenda? Now is your opportunity. Seeing none. Uh, the first several items are going to deal with um, proposal for pay and display parking at Fort Williams Park. Um, I just want to make a note that um, the normal operating procedure is to have all items that are up for public hearing uh, as the first things on the agenda and then other things to follow. Um, if you look closely at the agenda, there is one item that's not a public hearing, but it does relate to um, the pay and display parking, and that's the draft statement of policy that we'd worked on. Um, item number 79-2019. Um, I specifically asked that that be taken out of order simply um, for the purposes of grouping together all the Fort Williams stuff, and then we'll move on to the fiscal 20 budget. Um, additionally, um, I've also asked Matt, and he um, graciously agreed, to put together um, a couple of slides uh, that distill uh, into a very broad overview, um, sort of what we're talking about as it relates to Fort Williams, some of the high level points uh, for the benefit of the public. Um, and so he's done that. So we're gonna go through that first and then we'll open up the floor um, for anyone that wishes to speak as part of the public hearing. So Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Good evening, counselors. Uh, thought this might be helpful to engage the discussion or to move the discussion forward as uh, you, yeah, as we work to try to, uh, I guess, inform and, and educate the public as to what we're actually proposing uh, with this pay and display program to bring it forward. So uh, back at a number of months ago, I put together a frequently asked questions memo that, for the council that we have on the website. And we still have that information that's there. If people want to have greater level of detail, that's available for uh, the public to review. We do have a hot link on there under, well, a link under hot topics if people would like to go there to look at all the information that the council has received regarding this topic over the past uh, year plus uh, reviewing the subject matter. So uh, without further ado, I'll move forward. So what are the details? So we are looking at a pay and display program to be established at Fort Williams Park between the dates of May 1st and November 1st to, to basically capture the season, uh, the high season for parking when the largest volumes of tourists uh, come, to the, come to the park. An important detail to clarify is that Cape Elizabeth residents will park for free, uh, simply by the displaying of a, of a window decal that we will have crafted uh, once this is approved, located onto their glass, you know, onto the windshield, similar to a transfer station sticker. Uh, we may try to dual purpose that so we can get high participation in both programs, uh, so they can have that to identify and will not be receiving any citations for, for over, overuse of parking. Uh, Non-resident parking rate is looking, we're looking at $2 per hour for a minimum of two hours. Uh, this is based on the average visit is roughly an hour and a half. Uh, so we feel that this captures what the majority of uh, our visitors will end up having to pay for, so that way you're looking at a $4 minimum to stay for the two hours. However, if people would like to stay for the full day, they'd be looking at a $10 uh, full day ticket. Now, if they would like to come back multiple times over the season, the most, cost, the most cost effective manner to do this would be to buy a season pass. And we're looking to that, provide that to be available at $15 per year. Uh, as you re may recall, looking at all the different revenue projections, the, the primary 
primary revenue that's going to be generated will be on the hour lease. Um, we have looked at different levels for season passes and find that that would be a low end of what the uh, revenues to be generated would be and also felt that that is a good way to find middle ground for those who mul multiple time users versus uh, those single trip users and trying to provide that benefit. Also fall into, fall into line with the grants that the town has received and meaning to have any type of uh, fee structure be reasonable. And so uh, it's felt that that more than meets the reasonableness measure, especially in comparison to other communities surrounding us that have different beach passes and park passes from roughly 100, 125 to $200 plus. So we felt that that was a good middle ground. What areas will be pay and display? Currently there are five lots that will be metered parking. These are in many ways what you would consider the premium lots that are closer to the water, closer to where people want to see uh, the attractions that are at Fort Williams, such as the Lighthouse, Ships Cove, as well as uh, uh, down towards the central parking lot. There will be uh, approximately 280 spaces that will be pay parking. We picked up some additional spaces through the current project, that central lot with the paving project, and creating and establishing the parking line areas and having some order placed in that parking lot. So. Uh, we picked up an additional 10 spots there. Uh, there will be free parking available, and it will be towards the rear of the park near the children's garden area, the playground area, and in the officer's row area. Uh, the thought behind that was that A, it would try to mitigate any type of uh, toll avoidance by having to park in the neighborhood. If people are looking to avoid paying for parking, they can park in the rear area, as well as if you feel that you don't have the money to pay for that, there will be that free parking available right there for you. Uh, so that's, that's part of the thought, as well as promoting the areas that you have people who may visit for a small period of time in the children's garden area, as well as the playground area. Why pay and display? In many ways, it's, dri it's driven by volume. The volume has increased dramatically over the past decade. Uh, the last time this was, a, was reviewed as a subject, uh, we were having roughly 500,000 visitors annually or 190,000 trips. It's almost doubled in the, since the last time. We're close to uh, 900,000 visitors estimated somewhere between 750 to 900. A good summer, you're probably looking at the higher end. It's also uh, the relationship between main state visitors versus visitors from out of state has, that dynamic has changed over the past uh, past few years. Whereas before it was roughly 40% uh, out of state tourists, 60% main residents, now you're looking at that has flipped. Uh, you're looking at over 60% of visitors come from out of state. And that was done by a, a plate census that was performed on multiple occasions over the past, past year. Ultimately, it comes down to revenues as one of your other motivations. Uh, we need to find a way to offset the operating cost of the park. This is one method that can be done versus simply from the property taxpayer's perspective. Uh, it's not free, uh, although it may be free to many, but it hasn't been free to the Cape Elizabeth taxpayers. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to find a way to offset the ongoing revenues. Uh, one could just take a look at the park and see the investment that's taken place over the past year from operating expenses of roughly 300,000, and then most recently infrastructure improvement of 450,000 approximately for the central parking lot improvements. With this funding in place, we'll be able to find a way to provide for the long-term needs of the park and the sustainability of the park. Uh, whereas it is in great demand, that doesn't come without a ticket attached to it. So this would provide means by which the town can sustain that park for long-term. This is also another way that financial support for the park can be provided by all users of the park. Right now, ultimately, there's a small amount of income that comes from donation boxes as well as from the tour bus uh, fees. However, the primary source of funding to operate the park has been provided strictly by the property tax. And this is, as I state there, non-property tax-based revenue. And as the council has heard on multiple occasions, there's a desire to find other income streams besides specifically the property tax. I mean, your two big ones, quite frankly, are property taxes and uh, excise tax. This is another way that can be creative and it's, uh, and it's almost for a pay-as-you-go. It also, 
one of the designs behind pay and display would help in achieving the pay and display, I'm sorry, the park vision statement that was approved by council last year. And for that matter, I, I, this is on our website, but I also attached it here this evening. The town's vision for Fort Williams Park is to provide a safe, high quality space for capitalism of the citizens and visitors to enjoy. We will protect and maintain access to the park's historic elements and natural beauty for this and all future generations, and optimize the town's stewardship by managing the park through financially and ecologically sustainable practices. It's the, it's the uh, I'm postulating that this would be another way to help the town and the town council accomplish this vision, or at least one, one tool in your toolbox. Finally, what was the process? If you take a look at the town's website, you'll notice that there have been 13 different meetings and workshops all held to discuss the subject matter, all of them which were open to the public. Uh, last, uh, last summer, there was a special subcommittee of the Fort Williams Park Committee that I was also appointed as an ex-officio member of uh, that investigated the whole, the whole concept and brought forward their report to the council. At the end of that process, this was brought forward to the council with the, recommend, with the recommendation or at least the results of the study. At that point, there was a request for proposals that was put out to the, out to the general public and we received uh, a good number of interest at the outset and then we ultimately received one response for full parking management service. And again, as I said earlier, there's a dedicated section on the town website with all the displays on pay and display if people would like to find a, a slower way to absorb all this information. But everything that we've generated up to this point is available there. And if uh, we can be of further assistance to help folks understand and take in that information, we're more than happy to. Thank you Great. very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Appreciate it. So with that um, a good overview, I'm going to open up a public hearing. If there's anybody here from the public that wishes to speak on this item, please come forward to the podium at this point. Um, you can just give us your name and address, and please limit your comments to about three minutes in length. So public hearing is now open. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? Uh, good evening, my name is Scott Dorrance, 10 Elmwood Road. Uh, I'm here, actually I'm not sure why I'm here. Uh, the last two times that the town has voted on this, they said no to uh, paid parking. And I was here six, eight weeks ago and I brought that up again. So my feeling is, is if the town uh, had asked the citizens to vote on this twice in the past, that the citizens should get a chance to vote on this again and this whole parking thing should be held off until this town citizens had said yes or no to this. So my feeling is until we get a vote by the citizens that nothing should happen and we should see what they have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak on this? My name is Jim Kearney. I live at 1015 Shore Road. I'm a 37-year resident of uh, Cape. I'm directly across the street from Fort William, so I have a lot of visibility into what's going on over there. I also, by way of full disclosure, am a member of the Fort Williams Park Committee and have been working on this specific project. Um, thank you, Matt. Great presentation, a lot of stuff that I thought I was going to say tonight to cover in your presentation, so I don't have to go too deep into it. I will say, um, per the last gentleman's comments, the last two times this came up for referendum, I was strongly opposed to fees at Fort Williams Park and vocally opposed to uh, fees at Fort Williams Park. I have uh, completely changed my stance on that um, as a result of the visitor influx at Fort Williams, the amount of folks that are coming from out of state. The fact that it used to be a town park where we'd go with our families and now it's definitely turned into a kind of a tourist destination where well more than half of the visiting cars are from out of state. So when we did traffic studies, there were 280,000 cars two years ago that visited the park. Over 60% of those are from out of state. There were 1,000 tour buses that visited the park last summer, and we think that extrapolating that, there were over a million visitors to Fort Williams. So it's clearly not the community park that it once was. One of the challenges that's happened as a result of that is we have massive infrastructure and safety improvements which need to be made to Fort Williams, and frankly, to fund those is very expensive. Matt reviewed the budget. 
we've got like a three hundred thousand dollar capital budget, a three hundred thousand dollar operating budget, a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar parking lot that's going in kind of above and beyond most of that, and that's just scratching the surface of some of the road repairs, pathway repairs, um, fencing, uh, safety enhancements that, that need to be done to Fort Williams. So there's a, a lot of money that needs to be uh, spent. Um, I think as residents, we were all happy to pay for the park when it was our community park, but now that it's not community park, I mean, nobody wants to have to pay for something that was always free, but I think now is the time that we need to re-examine that and ask our guests at Fort Williams to start bearing some of the costs of managing the park, enhancing the, uh, the um, safety of the park and preserving the, the natural beauty of the park. Um, town manager mentioned that there will be free parking and also from a comparative uh, purpose for people that are looking at the season's pass, if you go to Crescent Beach with a couple and two teenagers, it's going to be $32 for the afternoon if you're a visitor from out of state. If you go to Fort Williams for the same couple hours, it's going to be $4. So, so we think it's the proposal is very um, aggressively priced and friendly priced for our neighbors, you know, whether they're coming from South Portland or from Seattle, a $15 annual fee for a season's pass is, is very, very low. I asked uh, folks in the park when I was walking around what they thought of that fee. One woman from South Portland said she thought it was ridiculously low. Another woman from Portland said on the days when she can't walk at Fort Williams, she goes to the gym and she pays $15 a day to go to the gym. So she thought it was, again, more than fair for a season's pass. Um, so, um, the, so, so, so in my perspective, now is the time to preserve the natural beauty and to enhance the safety at Fort, Fort Williams Park and to ask our guests to share in the cost of continuing to enable this to be a world-class facility for generations to come. My perspective is a little help from a lot of people can go a long way towards preserving Fort Williams Park. So I do ask the town council to think strongly about approving um, their pro proposal that's on the table. I also want to say I talked to the gentleman that manages all of the state parks for Southern Maine. So I'm not exactly sure where the border is, but there's, there are two folks that direct the parks, one in the Southern region, one in the Northern region. And his comment to me was, as stewards of Fort William Park, it is a citizen's duty to control, protect, and preserve the park for future, for its future viability. As such, you must design the parking lots and the parking fee structure in alignment with the carrying capacity of the park and to preserve the excellent park experience. I think that's really the challenge that we're facing. I thought mm -hmm. the way that uh, the gentleman's name is Gary Best, the way that he kind of positioned that comment about it's, it's really our responsibility to manage the preservation and enhance the safety of the park. And, and the best way to do that is to have that fee structure. So my comments, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else from the public that wishes to speak as part of the public hearing? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Thank you. Um, so our first item on the agenda then is number 78-2019, pay and display parking at Fort Williams. We've had the good overview. We've had um, two comments from the public. Um, as you see from the agenda, the intention tonight is uh, to ultimately table this item to next week. Um, matters of significant importance, we usually um, you know, hold a public hearing like this and, and try not to have the vote uh, happen on the same night so that counselors can you know, digest the input that we've heard um, and react to that. I will entertain any discussion at this point or if anybody wants to answer anything in response to either of the members of the public that, um, that uh, did speak as part of the public hearing. Don't feel like you have to, but I'll give you that opportunity. Um, I will say, um, it is surprising to me um, that here at the public hearing this evening and then in the lead up to this that we've not received um, very much public input on this. Uh, there has not been any great groundswell of people in either opposition or um, proponents of this, which I find interesting, um, for, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, when it was referenced, you know, that this has, has been out for referendum before, twice, and certainly recall a lot more 
um, discussion sort of in the public square, if you will, and, and certainly um, people coming before meetings like this um, to voice an opinion one way or the other. So uh, it is a little surprising um, to not see more people here tonight. Um, again, the vote is scheduled for next Monday, so we may hear from more people before then, um, and we may hear more by way of email leading up to it. But I just wanted to share that with the public that, that we really haven't heard that much um, from anybody uh, on this. So um, if anybody else, nobody else has any other comment to make tonight, I'll look for a motion to table this to our May 13th, 2019 meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan, seconded by Caitlin Jordan. Is There is no discussion for a motion to table, so all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, last item relating to Fort Williams, as I mentioned, is item number 79-2019. Um, if you've been following along with this at some of our recent meetings, we have had some discussion about um, what, uh, what direction or guidance should be given to what use of any potential revenues incurred um, from a parking scheme at Fort Williams would look like. So before you on the agenda tonight is uh, the language that we've drafted and reviewed at multiple workshops. Uh, I'll read it for the public here. Uh, revenues generated by the pay and display parking program at Fort Williams Park will be employed for the following. Primarily offsetting the operational expenses and capital improvements of Fort Williams Park, long-term capital needs of the town, and general municipal operating expenses. And uh, I will say there's been a lot of discussion and those are purposefully ordered in that way as part of this statement. Um, so for this item, I'll invite anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this. Seeing none, I will similarly look for a motion from the council uh, to table this to uh, coincide with our vote on actually implementing pay and display to Monday, May 13th, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Councilor Randall. Is there a second? second. Councilor Penny Jordan. With the motion to table, all those in favor? Okay, so we'll take up both of those next Monday evening, uh, right back here. So our next items relate to the fiscal, 20, fiscal year 2020 budget. Um, so the first item is public hearing on the fiscal 2020 budget. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on uh, the general fund and special funds budget? This is your chance, no? Okay. So the public hearing is opened and simultaneously closed. Um, the budgets uh, for both the municipal and school are available on our town website. Um, there's a, um, in the hot links and over on the school website, um, there's been an abundance of information available for people to, to review and consider. All of the meetings um, pertaining to uh, the budget have been uh, archived and there are either minutes and or video available for all of them. So if you're interested, you can look at that. Um, so first item is uh, item number 80-2019. Uh, looking for a motion, having held the public hearing on uh, May 6 to adopt the municipal budget for fiscal year 2020 with the following gross appropriations for each listed department. And those are included in the agenda. Do I need to read those out, Matt? No. Is there a motion? So moved. Mo moved by Councillor Gabrielson, seconded by Councillor Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 81-2019 is the school budget approval. Uh, first I'll ask if there's anybody from the public that wishes to speak on item number 81-2019, the school budget. Seeing none. Um, For this item, we're referring it to 13th, right? Yeah, it was actually 80 to 85, but you adopted that, so it'd be 81 to 85 to May 13th. Oh, was 80 supposed to go to the 13th? Yeah. Oh. Do we need to undo that? Unless you want to adopt the municipal along with special funds tonight. 
It doesn't have to be within the 30 days. The municipal would not, the school does. No, well, no, let's be consistent. Okay. So my mistake. Um, Just have the uh, original, the original motion for ADG uh, withdrawn. Yeah. And then, uh, and then you can amend, and then, or you could amend the. So, Councilor Gabrielson, would you like to withdraw your previous motion um, that we just voted on for adopting the budget? Yes. My apologies. And, Councilor Jordan, would you withdraw your second? Thank you very much. Moving a little too fast there, I apologize. So, I am instead looking for a motion to table item number 80 2019 to vote on next Monday. So thank you, Councilor Gabrielson. Councilor Jordan again, thank you. So, with the motion to table, all those in favor? Thank you. All right, back to the school budget. Item number 81 2019. Is there seeing no members of the public wishing to speak as part of the public hearing? Uh, the public hearing having been held on this date, in spite of no participation, is there a motion to table to vote on May 13th, 2019? So moved. Do we, yes. do we want, if, if can I we take just... the whole group and just table them? Sure, we can take them in block. I, we usually set, we usually peel out the school budget because there's usually okay. conversation about it, but this is unusual to not have anybody here to speak no. about it, so. Mr. Chairman, yep. if I may, uh, there's Please. one, there's one uh, area that it may be helpful, at least to, the, to next week's process, if the council would like to discuss it. It's oh, on, thank uh, you, number, yeah. number seven yep. uh, on, on the school section regarding the, uh, it's uh, about uh, policy decision yep. regarding anticipated uh, new revenues from the, from the state. So we and, want to talk about that first. And then, okay. Yeah, if, if, if you'd like to uh, change that tonight would be a good thing. That way you could have that language in, in we could have that language in place for next week if, if it would so please the council. Very well. Um, so as Matt said, and for the benefit of um, some of the newer counselors, um, the language on, on this um, clause of the school budget, uh, the municipal warrant and the school budget has changed um, uh, over time. Um, but basically what it is, is a, a, a um, sort of hold no harm against the schools um, and, the, and the school board in the event that their budget, um, that they would to receive less revenue, um, uh, it, it says that that shortfall will be made up, number one. But um, the other part of it is that should they receive additional revenue more than expected, what happens to that additional revenue? Um, so the basic three options on that, um, not to oversimplify it, are that all of that money stays within the school budget and goes into their unassigned fund and then gets dispersed per the rules that we've gone over as part of our workshop, joint workshop with the school board a couple weeks ago. Um, in recent years when the, um, uh, if there was you know, discomfort uh, on the part of either the council or you know citizens that we were hearing from about the amount of the school budget, um, the clause is adjusted such that a portion uh, is represented here, 50-50% um, would go to the school's contingency uh, on assigned fund balances, and then the other half would go directly to property tax relief or taxpayer um, uh, relief. And then obviously the third option would be for you know, all of that to happen. So um, the language here is, as I believe that's how it's appeared the last two years at least. Um, so if there's anybody that has any opinion on this as a policy, um, we can certainly bring that up now. And uh, as Matt said, it makes the most sense to probably try and land on um, an agreed upon direction here, but it's also something that can be just like anything else related to the vote next week. Um, debated or discussed or amended there too. So does anybody have any comment they want to offer at this point? Councilor Straw. I guess uh, just as a brief comment, um, basically the school department has had a, uh, has basically a, an account or a, a, an amount set aside that grows and shrinks as uh, economic conditions change. And it allows them to smooth out the effect of changes in uh, the, the state subsidy and costs of education and whatnot. Sometimes they add money into the account. Sometimes they, they, they pull it out to uh, buffer or smooth out the, the impact on property taxes. 
What's happened slowly over time, in part because of the fact that we've used this provision, where we're sending, where we've said we're going to just use it to reduce, in part, property taxes rather than fill that uh, buffer account up, is the buffer account has been drained down uh, smaller and smaller. So we can adopt this approach, but what it means is that we'll see more uh, peaks and valleys with the uh, school budget going forward if they don't have a sufficient, uh, sufficient sized account to be able to smooth out the impact over time. Mm -hmm. I think I got that right. Okay, my perspective is, you know, we are now, what, eight, eight and a half, nine years into one of the longest uh, economic expansions that we've had in a while. I, I would tend toward putting a greater portion into the school's contingency account on the expectation that we may not be getting as much state aid revenue in out years and replenishing that account now seems to make some sense to me, especially when we've got a relatively modest overall rate of growth in, in property taxes in this current fiscal year. Other comments? Councilor Deborah? I'm, when did it change? Uh, Councilor Straw was saying that this change that it used to all pretty much all go into the school's um, unassigned fund balance. Do you know what, how long ago that changed? And have is that? Uh, I guess we could ask um, the superintendent if she knows the impact that it's had on the schools. Um, I know that this has come up. Uh, you know, I'm I'm in my fourth year on the council now, and I know that it's come up during that time. Um, I don't know if it had previously come up before, uh, if either Councilors Jordan can remember if that's the case or not. Um, and like I said, it's, it's also um, been debated about whether 100% of any um, windfall, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, gets directed or a portion of it, as is the case right now. Um, I think, I believe during my four years, it's been both. There was one year where it was 100% and then a subsequent year where we, we split it 50-50 here. Um, there was, I, I do recall, um, a spirited debate one year on the school budget amongst the council about whether or not to uh, reduce uh, the overall amount of the school budget and it was almost eerily coincidental that year, the amount that we actually wound up getting in excess of projected revenues from the state wound up being almost exactly what was being sought to reduce the school budget by. Um, so that was kind of an interesting scenario that played out. But um, so it's it's. I mean, over t over time, it's it, it's been handled differently, and and again, it's it's a policy decision. Council makes and the the other thing is that I mean the the clause can just be removed altogether, which is effectively the first of the three options that I mentioned, of where 100 percent of it would go for the school board to handle as they saw fit. So, count, uh, Town Manager Sturgis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. If, I may, uh, if it may be helpful to the council uh, to the discussion, the fact that the town is now consider what you call a, a minimal receiving district. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you would anticipate uh, a giant fluctuation. So it may not be, you might look at some differential, but uh, not as great as it may have been. I think four years ago was probably the high water mark when the town received uh, roughly $3.4 million. And that would, and that was the, the apex of any school funding for over the past 10 years. Uh, tenure in 2008, it was roughly 2.4 million, and it kind of tracked along that number until it popped up that one year, which is when I think this clause really kind of had its uh, its uh, its heyday as well, if you will. So uh, I don't think you can anticipate that there's going to be, unless there's a dramatic change in school funding at the state level, uh, specific to minimal receiving districts, that you're going to see probably a large windfall. So it may not be as relevant. Uh, a clause now as it, what, as it may have been in the past. Uh, just for, for reference and after knowing that the raise the floor uh, 
effort at the legislature came down with a 7-0 not to pass. Uh, we're not looking at that changing anytime uh, soon either. The 55% funding level that the legislature is discussing pretty regularly uh, may not have as much impact on Cape Elizabeth as it may have in other towns that aren't minimal receiving districts. So I don't, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but uh, I don't think you're looking at as much of a math problem as you may have been uh, prior to the paradigm change of funding. Yeah. Councilor Jordan. Um, I actually agree with the 50-50. Um, I, I really think that um, over the years, the, um, uh, the, the town, the municipal uh, part of the budget has, has sometimes pushed the envelope on how to reduce the budget in order to ensure that the taxpayers didn't get um, significant increases. Uh, and so tried to balance that. And so I, I personally think this is the uh, most fair way to look at it. Um, so I, I would stay with the policy as it is. Councilor Randall. Um, I don't know if anyone knows this, perhaps Donna can help us out, but um, how else is the school's unassigned fund balance replenished? So, um, and Donna, feel free, or Catherine, um, to speak up on this, but um, so like on the municipal side, um, any, um, any funds that remain in accounts unspent roll over into the unassigned fund balance for the next fiscal year. Um, there is also the ability to fund the, you're supposed to carry a certain amount um, per governmental auditing um, recommendations. So you can also fund the specifically unassigned fund balance too. Um, I know at the various school budget workshops and um, at, at least one of our um, joint school board, town council um, sort of subcommittee meetings, there was some discussion about um, some other districts that um, rather than carrying a certain surplus in their unassigned fund balance, they um, create and fund specific, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the replenishment uh, yeah, reserve accounts. Reserve accounts yeah. um, so they might have specific, you know, we have a handful of reserve accounts in Cape One that comes to mind is for the Hannaford Field eventual replacement. So knowing that that field is going to need to be replaced after 10 or 15 years of use, it's been a small amount of money going into that every year. Um, there are other districts that were referenced um, uh, by the interim business manager where um, that's a regular practice for them. So instead of carrying an unassigned fund or, or contingency, they are putting money into specific reserve accounts for specific endeavors. Um, so, so any any additional revenues or unspent funds in accounts is how unassigned fund balance gets replenished. And in the past number of years, recently, um, it has been drawn down um, repeatedly by the school board in an effort to offset um, expense increases and lack of revenues. Any other discussion? Uh, is there a consensus to leave this as is for next week's meeting? Uh, continue discussion and debate on it, but have this be what we have before us for next week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with that being said, and thank you for the discussion, um, uh, with the clause saying as is, uh, is there a motion to table this to May 13th, 2019? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Second. Councilor Devereaux. All those in favor of tabling. Okay. So next up, items number 82, 83, 84, 85. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on any of these items? Seeing none, uh, we'll look for a motion and block to um, uh, also table those to May 13th, 2019. So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Councilor Randall, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next items we will be voting on tonight, number 86-2019, the Cape Elizabeth Rescue Fund budget. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? 
Seeing none. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the uh, Cape Elizabeth Rescue Fund budget with approved expenditures of 549917 and approved revenues of $325,000? So moved. Councillor Penny Jordan, seconded by Councillor Gabrielson. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 87-2019 is the sewer fund budget. Seeing no members of the public that wish to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 sewer fund budget with approved expenditures of $2,112,871 and approved revenues of $2,040,300? Okay. Councillor Gabrielson, is there a second? Councillor Penny Jordan, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 88-2019 is the Cape Elizabeth Spurwink Church Fund budget. Seeing no members of the public that wish to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget with approved expenditures of $10,491 and approved revenues of $1,200? So Councilor Randall, is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Item number 89-2019, Cape Elizabeth Riverside Cemetery Fund budget. Seeing no members of the public that wish to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget of approved expenditures of $56,043 and approved revenues of $66,000? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Randall, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 90-2019, Portland Headlight Fund budget. Seeing no members of the public that wish to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget with approved expenditures of $670,000, big pardon, $670,241 and approved revenues of $688,200? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Randall, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Item number 91-2019, the Fort Williams Park Fund budget. Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget with approved expenditures of $290,975 and approved revenues of $270,700? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan. Councilor Randall, are you interested in a second? <laughs> you guys are on the roll. All those in favor? Or is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Number 92-2019, Cape Elizabeth Infrastructure Improvement Fund Budget. Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak on this, uh, is there a motion to approve this $0 budget for both expenditures and revenues? So moved. Councilor Straw, jumping in on that. Is there a second? second? Councilor Jordan? Any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Number 93-2019, the Thomas Jordan Fund Budget. Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget with approved expenditures of $37,035 and approved revenues of $40,000? So moved. Councillor Penny Jordan first, Councillor Devereaux second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Last, the number 94-2019, Land Acquisition Fund Budget. Seeing no members of the public here to speak on this, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget with approved expenditures of $0 and approved revenues of $32,914? So moved. by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Randall, any discussion? All those in favor? All right. That concludes our budget items. Uh, next up, we have item number 95-2019. Uh, this is uh, Kettle Cove boat launch, right? Not board yes. launch. Yes. Boat launch Sorry. grant support. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, uh, just a reminder that this was added um, due to the date needed to get in for this grant. I think it's a great example and opportunity of um, you know, pursuing additional funding resources for these kinds of things. Um, we received a memo um, from uh, the town planner detailing uh, uh, the program and 
the source of the funding and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you'll remember, this was also part of the Harbors Committee recommendation. Um, so it works towards one of the goals that was outlined in the Harbors Committee recommendation um, to uh, secure the access down at Kettle Cove. So uh, is there a motion to approve the grant, uh, grant application? Second. Councillor Caitlin Jordan moves. Councillor Gabrielson second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Last item is number 96-2019, authorization of a bonus to the town manager. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, this is uh, no surprise to Matt. Um, and uh, part, part of our discussions is uh, we went through the review process, the annual review process. It was the unanimous agreement of the council uh, to consider granting a $2,000 one-time bonus in lieu of the uh, manager's uh, strong performance. That bonus is gonna be paid from the administration full-time payroll account, which is noted here. Uh, is there a motion to approve the bonus? So, Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? I just want to say that is so well deserved, Matt. You've done a fabulous job. Thank you, Councillor. I knew when we hired you, <laughs> you would. Any other discussion? Mr. Mr. Chairman, yep. I just want to thank the council for a, for a great for a great year and a great two, and I greatly appreciate this uh, movement of generosity. So thank you, and uh, I'll, I'll keep I'll just keep digging. So <laughs> thank you for having me. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Is there anybody here that wishes to speak on something that is not was not on the agenda this evening? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Could I say something? I hear yeah. we're, we are uh, swearing in a female police officer tomorrow. Is that true? Awesome. Great, great. I'll be there. Excellent. I believe this fulfills one of your requests, yeah. Council Randall, right? Um, I was like, I can hear his voice. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else? So just a reminder, next Monday night is when we will vote on both, um, we're scheduled to vote on both the pay and display parking item that was discussed this evening, as well as um, the full municipal and school budgets. Seeing no further items, is there a motion to adjourn? I could get that, but I'll move it. That would matter. I'll second it. Caitlin, second by Penny. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll see you Wednesday night. Who did you ask? I said less than two minutes.